Well, if it isn't another season of From coming to an end. Huh? Just answer me! Answer me! And I think I found out the problem of the show. The problem is there's too much we don't know. Well, that's putting it lightly, Jade. Thankfully, I've spent too much time rewatching this season over and over again, searching for clues on just what the hell is going on. And in this video, we'll be taking a deep dive into its ending and what it could mean for season three. And yes, I'll be sprinkling in new information about that cryptic season one cave painting as we go along. As always, I've left timestamps below to all the topics I'll be covering. Now get ready to climb the lighthouse because here we go. Last Last episode left us with Julie, Marielle, and Randall looking like me after trying to figure out what's going on. It appears they are the three chosen to replace the three bodies from the medieval chamber Boyd discovered in the first two episodes. And they are connected to the first three lines of the nursery rhyme heard in episode eight. They touch, they break, they steal. Marielle stole morphine, Randall pretty much breaks everything around him, and he also stole Donna's car keys and tossed them into the forest. This leaves us with Julie. She hasn't really broken or stolen anything of note, so she may fall under touch, having touched the hearts of several of the townspeople. We'll even see her wearing a sweater full of hearts. She's cheered Elgin up and is always there for her brother. This may all sound like a bit of a stretch, but that's all we really have to go on at the moment. When Boyd traveled to the medieval chamber in episode two, he saw that two out of the three captives were already dead, with Martin the emaciated Marine soon to follow. Martin's death seems to have put in motion a sequence of events which led to the emergence of the cicadas and the town eventually shifting toward winter. Remember Victor told us that up until now the town had been in a perpetual state of summer. What I found interesting however was Martin didn't have those creepy gray eyes. Why did Julie, Randall, and Marielle have them but not him? Martin also leaves us with a bunch of unanswered questions. Who kept him there? How did he know about Boyd's wife, Abby? And how did he get infected by those worms which he'll later pass on to Boyd. We also don't know if our Curse 3 saw anything while in their comas. We see them scream, reacting to something, but will any of them have memories of what happened when they were unconscious? When Boyd finally breaks the music box, it seems to release the three from their spell, but as the ghost of Boyd's wife will warn him, this only delays the inevitable. Later on in the video, I'll talk a bit more about who's orchestrating this spell and their motives in doing so. The finale also reintroduces us to the boy in white who we haven't seen since the finale of season one. Victor tells Tabitha that it was the boy in white who told him to wait in the caves for her in the finale. If this is true, it implies that he can foresee the future. Victor also knew the amount of graves to make the night Colony House was attacked. So this information probably came from the boy in white. While searching through the forest, Boyd wants to know if Sarah knows anything about this boy in white, to which she responds, I don't think he really was a little boy. This quote unquote boy is likely decades old and doesn't age. He's the same age when Victor finds the town has been massacred. And judging by his clothing, it looks like he could have been born any time from the early 1900s to 50s. While the boy in white seems to be evil by pushing Tabitha out of the lighthouse, he first apologizes apologizes, stating that this is the only way. This is the only way to save them all. And just a reminder before we go any further, if you like these types of videos, give it a like and subscribe. I do deep dives on tons of other shows. When Sarah arrives at the ruins of the chamber, she says this is where the music box is, but more ominously, she can hear the screams of Julie, Randall, and Marielle. Whoever or whatever has a hold of them is hurting them and quote, needs them to stay. It's almost as if whatever entity this is, feeds off their pain and suffering. When the monsters kill, they too play with their victims and make them suffer. They get enjoyment out of it. Made me watch. They said they wanted to play with me. Sarah also confirms that the entity is laughing at Boyd for setting him free, referencing how he brought the worms into town, triggering this situation. We'll see Sarah experience a nosebleed after this, the same thing that happened to Tabitha after seeing visions of the ghost children in episode five. Throughout the season, I've had my eye on Tilly. There's just been something about her that rubs me the wrong way. She somehow knew Fatima was pregnant, which triggered Elgin to remember his dream about the boy in white. She knew about Boyd and his adventure in the 
the forest even though she had just gotten into town, and she just so happens to drop off the morphine which Marielle would later steal for her drug addiction. One of the interesting things we learned about her in the penultimate episode was that she had seven grandchildren, and it just so happens there are seven children in the cave when Jade visits, and seven people in the prayer circle when she recites a psalm, Psalm 23-4, a passage from the Bible which emphasizes trust in a higher power in the presence of fear and evil. She was also pretty damn happy when she arrived in town, dancing in the rain, although that could be explained as her just enjoying some of her last moments with nature, as she'll later tell Christy she was diagnosed with some incurable disease. If we go back to the cave drawings from the season 1 finale, we'll also see seven black rectangles underneath the root symbol. Jade will see this image along with the seven children. Now throughout the season, Tabitha has been on her own journey, leading her on a quest to the lighthouse. It first started with visions of ghost children, then uncovering Victor's sister's drawings, and an obsession with one drawing in particular, that of the lighthouse. According to Victor, this is where his mother went the night she died, and she went there to save the children in an attempt to free everyone in town. Now Victor doesn't know where the lighthouse is, but he does know where his mother went the night she went missing, the bottle tree. The first time we saw the bottle tree was in episode 9 of season 1, but the tree in this episode is markedly different. The season 1 tree is thinner and doesn't have a faraway hole in it. Is it the same tree and has just changed, or are there two, possibly even more, bottle trees littered around the forest? Boyd will show Sarah that he managed to grab one of the bottles, and inside, written on a piece of bark, is the number 1864. 1864 is also one of the years written in Tabitha's lighthouse dream from Season 1. The latest date there, 1978, could be the year Victor emerged to find the town massacred, leaving me to believe all these dates are years in which a big catastrophic event event occurs. We'll even see a bottle littered on the stairway which Tabitha accidentally kicks down the stairs. Just another clue that these bottles are somehow connected to the lighthouse. Lighthouses are also meant to guide ships in to help them avoid dangerous rocks and land, while messages and bottles traverse the sea, so there's a little connection there. The lighthouse can also be seen in the cave drawing in Season 1. It seems to be guiding people on ships down a river. They have their hands up in the air, perhaps in distress or celebration at finding land. Around it appear to be triangle-shaped mountains and trees. The earliest year we saw engraved in the stone of the lighthouse was the year 1506, so maybe these are lost explorers from Europe celebrating finding land only to find out they've come to this cursed place. But things like Fresnel lenses, like those found in the lighthouse, weren't invented until the 1820s. But remember, things don't really make a lot of sense here, so it's completely possible. One thing I didn't spend too much time talking in my Season 1 cave analysis video are the conscious use of different colors. Three to be exact, red, white, and black. White seems to symbolize real living things in nature. We have people, trees, mountains, and birds. Black seems to represent the supernatural, the root symbols, seven children platforms, and maybe this is that hole Boyd was stuck in at the end of season one, or where he'll eventually find the talisman. And finally, there is red, meaning danger or perhaps evil. We have the lighthouse where the kids were supposedly held, this huge ominous figure who I think is the evil entity controlling the place, and you'll see some red human figures dancing around. Whether they be evil people or monsters, who knows? Tabitha wants to go on this journey because she knows how doing nothing won't solve anything. She waited around when their son Thomas was ill, and that got her nowhere. So now she's not going to do the same thing when Julie is ill. And can we just take a moment to recognize how amazing Victor was preparing a lunchbox of snacks for her? Victor notices that this tree isn't where it used to be. In season one, he remarked that the trees have a habit of moving, hence why he enlists Ethan to track down their movement. Now this particular faraway tree is different. When you enter a normal faraway tree, you never know where you're going to end up, but apparently this tree takes you outside the lighthouse every single time. As Tabitha ventures up the lighthouse staircase, you'll see the same children's dump truck and playing cards. There's a bunch of gears which seem to be operating the Fresnel light at the top, but take a look at this. Is it just me, or does it look like there could be a map display on the bottom of the light? I mean, it's possible it could be rust, but I'm just throwing it out there. A lot of the lenses seem to be bashed open as well, but the thing I found most strange 
no water, at least from the angles we were given. There's a lighthouse in the middle of a forest next to no water. We see Jade smashing bottles which he had previously formed into the shape of the symbol. He's become obsessed with this symbol ever since seeing it carved in blood on a tree near the Civil War soldier. He'll even be haunted by Christopher, the supposed evil man who had something to do with Victor's mom's death as well as the town's. Victor tells us that Christopher used to be a nice man and made everyone laugh until he saw that symbol. Maybe Christopher was the owner of that ventriloquist dummy who keeps haunting Jade. So Jade is smashing these bottles in an attempt to get a different perspective on what this symbol could mean, when he's haunted by Tom, the dead bartender who died by a monster after being crushed by Jim and Tabitha's house. That's a sentence. Ghosts are pretty common in town. Boyd's been visited by the ghost of Father Cotry and his dead wife. Whether this ghost is good or evil, who knows, but he definitely wants to help Jade find that symbol, pushing him to venture into the cave. Outside the cave, we see this blue bike. It either means that someone else is in there or perhaps Jade took this bike. There is a blue bike in the background of this shot outside Tian's house so who knows. Inside the cave, Jade is haunted by the voices of the children reciting the word Ankui, the cryptic word first heard by Tabitha. This word has yet to be cracked from anyone in the From fandom. I've personally tried rearranging the letters and searching for its origin to no avail. In the subtitles, it's spelled this way. However, user AnimPerfectStranger on Reddit theorized the spelling may be wrong, for if you spell it the Latin way, its translation sounds almost identical. Listen to this. Ankui. And it translates to this one. So no confirmation on this, but it's the best I have so far. Jade is treated to a horrific vision of the children on these almost sacrificial beds, staring up into the sky as this symbol takes the form of roots. At first it wasn't there, but when the kids arrive, boom. Personally, these roots also look pretty disgusting and almost worm-like. And worms were seen in the finale of Season 1 and also in Boyd's skin. No telling where these roots lead, but if I had to hazard a guess, it could be the bottle tree or some other faraway tree. Perhaps these roots create a network of faraway trees. And as quick as the kids came, they vanish, leaving Jade and me like, F*** my life! More than any other episode, the finale tackles grander themes of chaos and fate and light and darkness. Boyd mentions that Kotri never lost faith, even in his dying moments. In Season 1, Episode 6, Kotri says, Chaos and faith. That is the duality of our existence. Jade brings up chaos theory, that even though things may seem chaotic, it's all part of a big, beautiful plan. Christy used to believe in a grand design, but now she doesn't, with Kenny countering with a saying of his father's. It's hard to see the sweater when you're only just a threat. It's a metaphor for the show itself. Even though everything seems chaotic and that it doesn't make sense, we're just a thread unable to see the sweater or the grander picture. The episode also placed a lot of emphasis on light and darkness. In their marriage ceremony, Ellis talks about Fatima being his light that guides him through the darkness. This prompts Boyd to gather his torch and make his way back to the ruins. Light and dark places. I gotta go. This light somehow reveals the chamber where the music box is, but before he destroys it, he's visited by the ghost of his dead wife, the same ghost that beckoned him to join her last episode. I don't really think this is his dead wife, rather the entity using her image to bend Boyd to his will, so we can't really take anything it says at face value. Will the people of the town actually suffer if he destroys that box? According to this ghost, the entity wants the townspeople to have hope, because it's the presence of of hope which allows them to suffer, and suffering is what this entity feeds on. She refers to the forest as needing to be fed not by fear, but by hope. Boyd rejects this and smashes the music box which releases Julie, Randall, and Marielle from their suffering. The theme of good and evil, light and dark, was found in the television show Lost, which showrunner Jeff Pinkner of From also worked on. It's possible that good or light has manifested in a person or people, with the good being the boy in white, while the dark evil into this yet-to-be-seen entity. Well, coming back to the quote-unquote real world, Boyd finds a German shepherd watching him, almost as if this dog wants Boyd to follow him. This isn't the first time we've seen this dog. It appears to belong to the boy in white, and like him, doesn't age. 
age since we see him in Victor's flashback as a child. Victor's even made drawings of him. But there's this other cryptic drawing showing what could be Victor and his mom, or his sister, next to a dog, and this calls into question whether the dog is really the boy in white or Victor's. While searching for Ethan in Season 1, Jim and Tabitha find the dog in the forest, and in Episode 8 of Season 1, it was a German shepherd Boyd followed which led him to the discovery of the talisman. So it appears this dog has good intentions. Finally, the thing everyone's going to be talking about, Tabitha waking up in the hospital. After venturing up the lighthouse and hearing the whispers of the children saying Ankui, she is thrown off the top by the boy in white, only to awaken in the real world. According to the doctor, she was found three days ago by a group of hikers in the forest. It's important to note here that Tabitha is never mentioned by name, so we're unsure if the doctor actually knows her identity. There's also no sign of her family. On the computer screen, we can make out the name of the hospital, St. Anthony's. St. Anthony is the painter saint of lost and stolen articles, which I found rather interesting since all our characters are lost. Tabitha's body being found in a forest also eliminates the theory that residents of the town are all in some sort of coma or dream state. What I'm really curious about is if everyone who dies in town magically shows up back in the real world or if it can only be done under specific circumstances. I personally think it would be a cop-out if you killed yourself and boom, you're back in the real world. When Tabitha looks outside, she sees a seaside or lakeside town. We're not really sure if this is an American town, a Canadian one since the show is set in Nova Scotia, or a fictitious one created for the show. Regardless, it looks like Tabitha will be on a journey to get back to town and save her family, perhaps even meeting up with previous town citizens who managed to escape or maybe even died, leaving the possibility for Father Cotry and Abby to come back. I wonder if we'll also meet adult Eloise. We never really found out what happened to her after she chased after her mother. So as the season comes to an end, we are once again left with more questions than answers. But with Tabitha being in the outside world, I'm hoping next season provides us with some big revelations. But now I turn it over to you. What did you think of From Season 2? Leave your thoughts and theories in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Please be sure to like and subscribe. And for more bad takes, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember, my life. <laughs>